Let's start with Bally's and the bankruptcy and how much money Bally's is pouring into all of baseball. What can you tell us about what it means that Manfred has to come out yesterday and say, yeah, we expect to be paid. We expect money to be coming in that may or may not be coming in. He's actually talking to the bankruptcy court. Uh, what happens when you declare bankruptcy, you, you know, if you go just to the level of your house, when you don't make a mortgage payment, and then you miss a bunch of them and the bank has the right to foreclose. What that means is the bank then owns your house and banks are not in the business of owning homes. They don't wanna own a home. So therefore they're going to sell it. And that's when you can buy something in foreclosure and in theory get a deal because they want it off their books. So when, a, when they're saying that they're gonna go bankrupt, it doesn't mean they don't have a dollar. It means they don't have enough dollars to pay out what they need to pay out contractually versus what they're taking in. And what they used to take in was all of the money from you, the audience, who would pay your cable bill. And part of that cable bill would go to the networks to get on the cable, right? The cable company needs networks on the cable package. And then the networks need programming to put on the networks so that the cable companies will buy the networks. So the networks go out and buy rights. They buy live content. So there are 14 baseball teams where, who sold their rights to Bally's, to Sinclair. And then Sinclair said, hey, look at us. Let's get Fox Sports Florida on Comcast or on Spectrum, whatever the cable company is. But now we're all cutting the cord, which means the money has stopped flowing because the audience has said, I don't wanna pay for crap that I'm not engaging in. I don't wanna pay for the Great British Bake Off if I'm not watching the Great British Bake Off. I don't wanna pay for jazz if I, don't, if I like rock music. And I'm, that was a jazz chisel home mark. So now bankruptcy is I, when I you think say- explaining it kind of ruins it. Uh, you, but that's what it is. I'm trying to teach you what happened. And the, if you just, all right, let me do it in a way that maybe the Levitard show would like. You don't have to worry. You'll be able to watch your baseball team on TV. But I mean, okay. Are we okay I, with I, that, Dan? I, we, we I was were, just we were criticizing your jazz Chisholm joke. Yeah, it was That's a all. terrible joke. Otherwise, it was a, it was a good explanation. Until no, because Great British Bake Off is a BBC original show. Now it's on Channel Four and it's on Netflix, so you can't subscribe. It's not a Food Network show. It's not on cable, David. It's oh, sorry. So, all right, we're gonna, all right, straight. cut. Let's start again. Ready? Four, eight, twelve. Here's what's happening. Rob Manford has a problem in baseball because there are teams who make their budgets and decide to have player payrolls according to what their revenue is going to be. And a lot of their revenue comes from local TV deals. And if they don't get paid the money from their local TV deal, then they don't have the money to pay their payroll. Therefore, the players wouldn't get paid. However, there's something called the players union where the players have to get paid. So owners have to have the money to pay the players. Therefore, they have to have the revenue they thought they were gonna have. So MLB has to step in and pay the teams what the teams expected to get paid. However, they can't do it if they're not getting the money from you, the audience. Therefore, there is going to be a real problem with player salaries, a real problem with team revenue, because the formula that's been used for decades of local TV money helping to prop up player payrolls and keep them growing because rights fees were growing like crazy over the past 20 years, that entire model has gone away. So Rob Manford took the microphone and said, we have a great idea. We're gonna take all the rights in house we're gonna keep the digital rights like MLS did. We're gonna sell the digital rights as a package to some streaming service one of these years, which is our goal. We're gonna produce the games. We're gonna make them available to all of the fans of the Marlins and of the Braves, don't worry. But in the meantime, we're gonna figure out a new system of getting you these games because the old system doesn't work anymore. This is the most important TV story that's happened in our lifetime the change that is going on in how we engage with our sports. And the fact that it's gonna become a la carte and John Skipper, when he talks about Super Bowl pay-per-view and people laugh at him and say he's crazy, he's dead right. Because pay-per-view is the concept of, if you want it, you pay for it. If you don't want it, you don't need to pay for it. And baseball will have an issue if millions of people say, you know what, I don't need to watch my team. I'll wait for the World Series. If that happens, teams' revenues will go down, values will go down, and worse, 
player payroll will go down. But David, one of the things in following the story for a while is it is it has seemed like Rob Manfred, the MLB commissioner, is almost. He 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 said yesterday, I don't want our partners to fail. But I think they're almost excited at the proposition of what they can do with these rights instead of keeping yourself invested in the longer term in a model that is dying. The the cable pay TV model, these channels are not going up in subscribers. The the fees that they're getting are not going up. It's not going to be a business that increases. And I think that baseball is probably looking forward to what they can do with these. Would you say say that's the case? No, No, I would say they're trying to make lemonade out of lemons. So of course he's gonna say that publicly, but if they had a strategy, which they did, they didn't wanna implement the strategy with, uh, you know, with their feet to the fire, which happens when there's a bankruptcy. They'd wanna do it over time as these contracts were expiring. But the fact is this model has been so good for baseball because it's helped increase the value of teams. It's helped keep revenues growing because rights fees, no one ever dreamt that rights fees would ever do anything but go up. It's like our view of our homes or our view of different assets we own. We don't imagine the possibility they'll go down because it just doesn't happen all that often. So I don't think that Rob is happy, but I think he's trying to tell you that it's all okay. Believe me, Don Garber, he's not gonna tell you, and and Chris, you'll tell me if you disagree. When he sold the streaming package to Apple, he much rather would have had all teams have individual deals that were baseball sized deals because that would have made their teams more valuable than they are today. But but there is also the flip side of that, which is collectively they can make a big amount of money, kind of standardize broadcasts. And in, in the case of baseball, they're going to try and turn this into a big product for their own channel that they own. So, well, I love where your head is at because you say collectively, but in baseball, no one likes the word collectively because what that means, forget collectively bargained, what that means is that you've got the Yankees on the same page as the Marlins. And the Yankees don't want that at all. In Major League Soccer, while we had our first team, I think Forbes said LAFC is worth a billion now, I think they said. Yep. More than a billion. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a billion for LAFC. But the the band of what teams are worth in MLS is much smaller than in baseball. And so in, when you've got a sport where the Cowboys are worth seven and another team's worth four, you know, that's a big enough band where you don't want to use the word collectively because that, that's sort of like socialism where everybody is going to be worth the same and everybody's price of entry has been different. So you do not want that in your business. I declare that I am also worth a billion dollars. Hell yeah. Who's your agent? I'm not going to Apple not TV. Gonna name names. Apple TV, Let's David, is trying to or tried in its first season to do things a little differently in the booth and was soundly rejected for daring in baseball to do something different. So they're going to go back to broadcasting the way everyone else broadcasts. It bothers me. The, the scrutiny that baseball had, we would spend so many hours in meetings trying to figure out why whenever we do something, everyone criticizes it. But when other sports make changes, people are excited and they're okay with the rule changes or with anything that goes on. But in baseball, you change one thing and there's a ton of rule changes going on for this upcoming season. And baseball is always worried that they're gonna get overly criticized and then they do by all the traditionalists. Who are the traditionalists in football or basketball? Like who says you have to throw a set shot? Remember, oh, people don't know what that is, do they? Oh, but history and tradition are something that baseball has used as currency for a long time. And to me, the most damning thing that you just said about the entire business model, David, is that money was coming in at such a rate with these cable subscribers, TV rights that made the Dodgers all powerful, that the system itself and the teams benefited from that greatly, but the players weren't getting that money. Now the players are actually getting that money. They're getting contracts, right? They're getting these giant contracts that the model will not pay for as Bally's goes bankrupt. That's crazy that the salaries have fixed themselves to reflect the last 20 20 years of the model, but the model is now broken. How the hell are they going to pay all that money? It's really not true. Not one thing you said is true, actually. If you look at what percentage of revenue has gone to players, the first year I was in baseball, which is now 23 years ago, it's basically the same percentage of revenue, somewhere around 50 to 52, 48 to 52 percent of all revenue goes to players. That's what it's always been. David, the contracts have changed. The contracts. uh, So is the revenue. 
Um, and in the changing of the revenue, you just had an entity that went bankrupt that f that helps fund 14 of the teams. Exactly, which is why payroll is going to start going down, which is why the union is as engaged as MLB is on figuring out what to do you say, with this issue with Bally's. But you say payroll is about to go down, and what I'm saying is it just went up all over the sport. It's gone up everywhere based on what the last 20 years of surplus have looked like. Um, can you give me the numbers that back up what you're saying? Because here's the, here's the numbers. I'd like to look at industry payroll, not a particular player who gets overpaid on a 10 year deal until they're 52 years old. I'd like to look at final team payrolls, add it up and then compare it to previous years. And then you will see that it goes in lockstep with revenue. It's just been redistributed much like in the United States, where if you're the middle class, who are you? It's lower class and upper class. The middle class has been squozen, and that's the same thing in baseball. There's nothing worse than being mediocre in baseball. You're nothing. You're done. You retire. You're out of the league. You can't even get a non-roster invite. Uh, you you gave me the uh, the opening. You you mentioned the S word, socialism, uh, as it, as, it, as it relates sports, and I've sort of been curious um, with. How? What are you laughing about, Jessica? The S word. Well, because I, I mean, mean, his it's, questions it's, are very it's, wordy. No, it is a dirty word. We're in Miami, his Jessica. His questions are very yeah, wordy. I understood. I understand. It's a it's a dirty it's a dirty word in particularly amongst business people, and yet my I've always been curious at how you guys have managed to create it for yourselves. Like so, sports teams with revenue sharing and basically making sure that no one entity within this thing fails. You basically. In some ways, the Marlins profited from sports show, uh, socialism. Did you not? We didn't profit from it, but we had less loss from it. You survived because of it. Yes. So listen, our team was not our team was not worth what it was worth because of socialism, because of revenue sharing. Our team was worth what it was worth because there's only thirty of them, and we had an idiot who wanted one. But I should, mean, that's it. But shouldn't you like if it, if it were a fully capitalist capitalist world, either your payroll would have been less expensive, shockingly. Or you w would not have survived as a business, right? Correct. There'd be there'd be a super league, right? There'd be relegation. There'd be major league and minor league, and but, the Marlins, among by the way, with ten other teams, would be relegated. But if I asked any one of the owners who profits from these things, how do you feel about socialism or about higher taxes towards rich people? You you would be offended by the concept, and yet within sports, you guys create it for yourselves. Uh, we all do that, right? They're, all businesses do that. They all want tax breaks. They all negotiate with the cities where they're in to get tax incentives to do business in a city. There are people in every industry who are trying to get advantages, to figure out ways to make more money, make more profit. This is this is normal. That's actually capitalism, not socialism. But how do you how do you reckon with that sort of philosophically though? Like the notion that within within the billionaires' club there is socialism. But ask any individual billionaire about how they feel about the the way that governments work, and they will advocate on behalf of full throated trickle down economics, conservative uh, you know uh, principles mm -hmm. as it relates to economics. And yet, once we get into the billionaires club, then let's make sure we all survive. Haven't you ever wondered why most Republicans are Republicans when they're poor, and then when they become rich, they become Democrats? Have you ever really thought about isn't that the, concept? Isn't the opposite? No. There I thought, are way I more thought liberal was, rich I, people. I thought it was mm. the opposite. It's not. You'd be shocked. You'd be shocked. Now, there are people who don't necessarily want to, to admit to it, but they are. Really? It's so, a strange so thing. You, you think the Do you know the you way think, the Republicans the political... get, now we're get, talking politics, but the way Republicans get uh, elected into office is they try to convince people who don't have money that they are going to have money. But those who have money don't need to be convinced they already have it. So you, you think the political breakdown of Major League Baseball owners is more democratic than we'd think? Bunch of Bernie bros. I, I, now, now, hold on. I didn't say that. <laughs> there is nary a Bernie bro amongst them. But the overwhelming majority of Major League Baseball control people will vote blue, not red. Really? Uh, when the shocked. when the blue candidate is shocked. a centrist, maybe. Yes. I mean, they're not voting well, for listen, Elizabeth I mean, Warren. So let's, listen, let's, I I think about this all the time. What would you have done? What What do we do if it would be like Trump against Sanders? You know, what do you do? I mean, people, the owners say, "I'll move my team to Canada." And I'm 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 really surprised by this. I I figure that people who make this amount of money are always voting with their checkbooks in mind.
and always about what their what the corporate tax rate is and what the you know highest end tax rate is. They don't is. pay I'm, taxes, witty. They don't worry about the tax rates. God, that makes me sad. <laughs> you think when Joe Biden said at the State of the Union that it's strange that teachers and firefighters pay more taxes than billionaires? He didn't make that up. You think Trump is the only one whose tax returns show losses and that they don't pay taxes? It's a bunch of us W-2 people who fund the federal government. God. Nothing, nothing personal is the name of the podcast. You can get whatever it is that you need on the sports business side there. I'm telling you, and I will continue to tell you, that he is covering some ground that uh, many other people in the mainstream are not covering. Yeah, we uh, on, on on this week's episode, we talked a lot about what, the the Super Bowl, and we talked about John's idea uh, for for pay per view. But I, I wanted to talk to you, David, uh, in baseball about Shohei Otani, um, because it feels like it's coming down the road where he's either going to ask out or he is going to to look towards another team. Uh, but Mike Trout is kind of saying that there we want to try and convince him to stay in Los Angeles. Uh, do you think that the Angels have screwed it so much? that they couldn't possibly keep him? And what will his market look like when he eventually becomes a free agent? I love that you said that he can ask out. He cannot ask out. He is, a, he is an angel for the rest of the year. They could trade him at the deadline, but they won't unless they're out of the race again, in which case I would trade him. And then you can re-sign him if you want. And they put Mike Trout, and I just recorded this. It's funny. Please go listen to Nothing Personal. I'm sorry to say. But the quote that Mike Trout gave was so beautiful. He took the microphone and said, I'm going to do anything I can to keep him here. Are you willing to take a pay cut? No. No one asked that follow-up question. No, 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 no. No, not me. I'm not taking a pay cut. Are you willing to make sure that you guys win and that you stay on the field? Come on, Mike, what does that mean? He must have stood there because the angels went up to him and said, hey, listen, you're going to meet the media. Let's be positive. Let's not have a distraction. Let's say that it's all going to be roses and butterflies and paper cuts or whatever the expression is. The fact of the matter is Shohei Otani is going to go to whoever gives him the most money. And I've said it before. I'll say it again. He has no affinity to Artie Moreno or the Angels or Los Angeles. He doesn't care living in the shade of Space Mountain. He wants to set records. He's going to say, I want to win. I deserve to win. I want to be surrounded by winners. It's a bunch of horse hockey. He's going to set a record in all of professional sports. He's going to get more than the Saudi Arabians gave Ronaldo. That's how much Otani is going to get because he's two players. I've never seen anything like it in my career. If you sign him, you're getting a top of the rotation starter and a middle of the order bat. So if you're willing to pay $30 million for that player, that means you're willing to pay 60 for Otani. What do you think that number is going to end up being by the time that he signs, given the craziness of the contracts the last couple of off season? Uh, he'll get over $500 million. It's an absolute guarantee. That's nuts. He will get a 10-year deal for $515 million. And he will not be able to be worth it because it's not like basketball where you can bring in a big three. You can sign Durant, Irving, and Harden and win a championship. It's not like that. But he has not been part of a winning team. I, I know that's not his fault, but do, do you think that the team that signs him could ever hope to win with, with, with that kind of contract on their salaries? So the math with Otani is different than any other free agent. So teams will lie to you and tell you when they sign a free agent, they get all these increases in ticket sales and they'll give you, like the Padres, they'll show you a full... Uh, fan fest and they'll say we're sold out of season tickets. This is how we have a payroll of $260 million. It's absolutely ridiculous. The Padres are losing money this year, hand over fist. Otani's different. He is Ichiro on steroids. He's not really on steroids. When you sign Ichiro, there are companies from Japan who call you and say, we are now going to be a sponsor of your team. We'll do a seven figure deal with you because you've got Ichiro. Otani comes with eight figures of sponsorship revenue. So when you sign him, you know you're getting $10 million a year that you otherwise would not have gotten but for having him. And that money doesn't go to Otani in theory, it goes to the owner. Therefore, the owner knows they're getting a $10 million discount right off the top. Then you've got Major League Baseball international focusing on your team. You've got all the things you can do in Japan 
they are baseball crazy in Japan. When we went to Japan to announce Ichiro, he was like John Lennon. He's the most famous person I've ever been around in a place. He can't walk a step without people knowing who he is, whether they're four years old or 85 years old. There's not, there's no one like it in the US, even Michael Jordan. There are people who would walk by Jordan and not know who he is. No one walks by Ichiro and Otani is now even greater than Ichiro. David, I'm wondering if uh, I wonder if you've been following the current NCAA court case, which is uh, the NCAA is asking the U.S. Appeals Court to block uh, the designation of NCAA athletes as employees. You're nodding your head yes, so I assume you have been following this. It's a major, it, major case. It looks really bad for the NCAA now, and I'm wondering what their end game is here. Are they just trying to keep going through appeals court cases uh, until they, I guess. Uh, run out of legal money, billable hours. Like they're they're obviously going They'll to never lose run this, out of right? that. No, no. The only, you don't run out of money for billable hours. You run out of courts that'll hear your case. Right. Our system is, you know, you can only go to the Supreme Court, and even then, it's unlikely you'll get a hearing before the Supreme Court. They take a tiny percentage of the cases, and then you're stuck with what the appellate court says, which is the Court of Appeals. This is a big deal because if you have to designate athletes as employees, that means they get the rights that employees have. That means they can unionize. That means they will get minimum pay. That means they're no more of this ridiculousness of calling them student athletes. They are now just employees and you can treat them as such with all the good that comes with it and the bad that comes with it, which is raises, promotions and firings. So I, I understand what what is trying to be accomplished by people in the NCAA. But I think it's one of those cases where they don't realize that by winning, they're actually going to lose. And I viewed that with NILs, where there are some players who are gonna win because of NILs, but there are both players and franchises and colleges and universities who are gonna lose, which means that lower down programs like water polo and girls baseball and boys baseball and swimming, et cetera, that get funded by the big sports, if those funds go down, then those sports disappear. And if you don't have the funds from your top sports, you also don't fund academic chairs or different things that are happening in the academic world. And if you're paying players, boosters are paying the NILs, and instead of boosters giving money to fund other sports or, getting, or giving money to fund things in academia, if they're giving it to the players, Dollars are fungible, but it's not like boosters are going to double their amount given. I don't necessarily agree that it's a zero-sum game, but I, I get your point, and I think that any new system moving forward needs to address that. A, a lot of athletic departments already run most of their sports at a loss and don't profit off of college football to begin with. So to say that like paying your football players or your student-athletes slash athletes now means that we don't have a, a women's softball team I don't think is necessarily true. Also want to correct you. We, we don't have women's baseball in the, in NCAA Softball, sports. Softball, I'm sorry. Because of misogyny. So just want to make what? sure Wait. that we all know that. <laughs> I'm sorry. God. All right. Good to see everybody. <laughs> what did you make of the DeMar Hamlin interview on Good Morning America? Well, I'm not Danny Cannell. Um, listen, what what's everybody saying? Everybody is saying that when he doesn't answer what happened, the assumption is that he almost died because he got a vaccine. And that is what the anti-vaxxers are going with. And it's becoming like an avalanche of misinformation. There is no way after two years or three years that we are prepared or the scientific community is prepared to tell you that vaccinations are leading to death by heart attack or by, by cardiac arrest for athletes or for young people. Is it true that I'm reading more about athletes? Like there was a, a witty, didn't a soccer player, a goalie yes. save a PK and then drop dead? Yeah, yeah I, believe, I believe it was in Belgium recently. It was like a second division minor yeah. league team yeah. and he saved a PK and then died, right? When, when Reggie Lewis or Hank Gathers or other players where that's happened and, and uh, we didn't know why, there, there was speculation, but Hamlin, when asked that question, he don't realize, in my opinion, what can of worms he was opening. My guess is that he just doesn't want to talk about it 
because why would you want to talk if, about if it? Why I may, would you want to speculate? Uh, David, if I may, let me allow the audience that may not have seen the interview. He was asked by Michael Strahan a couple of different times, what did doctors tell you about what happened? Explain what happened here. And after very long pauses, he said, I don't want to talk about that, leaving a lot of questions where there could be answers and a lot of people who already are believing that he passed out or, or had cardiac arrest, arrest because of, uh, you know, the vaccine uh, opening up questions there that allow them to believe what they already believed. Why is it that there's an answer to everything? I sort of realize forgetting religion for a minute, which provides answers of questions that have no answers. Is it not true that there are some things that there just aren't answers for? Yes, uh, I, and I, I do not want to give any credence to the anti-vax community, but I mean, there have been a bizarre number of cardiac events, even just sort of anecdotally, like watching soccer matches. I've seen five games in the last year that have been delayed because of a cardiac event in the crowd, and I, I've never seen that before in my life. Um, and oh, we had cardiac events in the crowd all the time. I'm just, I'm just like that stopped games. I, I've watched I've watched a lot of soccer yeah, for a long time. I like there's <laughs> there was games that have been stopped because of cardiac events in the crowd and otherwise. Like there there are there are just things that are happening anecdotally and people are searching for answers and unfortunately they're turning towards this thing that is largely helping the broader society. Well, that that's my biggest problem and and I would have asked or counseled Hamlin to come up with a better answer than silence and then I don't want to talk about it because there is no way that he had cardiac arrest because of getting the vaccine, because we don't know that yet. There's not enough studies, there's not enough years that have passed that we can actually do an examination to draw any sort of correlation. So why leave a void? The problem in the media, when a void is left, it gets filled by misinformation. So I've always been of the, of the view that I don't wanna leave any voids. I'm gonna answer every question, and if I'm wrong, I'll fix it later but I'm not gonna leave a void to give you an opportunity to control the message or the flow of information. And that's what Hamlin did, and I wish he hadn't. But to defend him for a second, I I hadn't even heard of this conspiracy, and I, I'm an online person, but like this completely passed me by because I don't, I don't follow a lot of people who are peddling these sort of things on, on social media. I don't think if I were him, I would have known that this could have been a reaction to me telling the story of when I publicly collapsed on a field. Like everyone saw what happened. He got hit in the chest and he collapsed. I don't think I ever would, like I would never make the leap to like, people are going to think this is because of the COVID this is, vaccine. This is how I learned that Pfizer it's was in, one of the NFL's top sponsors uh, financially. It's how I learned it is because of what's being said around just, his non I don't know if that's even like a, a logical leap that most people take that aren't super online. Like that, to me, I'm, I'm not surprised because I've seen so much misinformation disinformation and and lies about the vaccine on on the internet but like Demar Hamlin was playing football and collapsed like people people get hurt playing sports all the time like we we see that happen but we haven't seen that happen playing professional football none of us we all had the same reaction at least in part because none of us had seen that but as soon as it happened I saw so many articles about how this is something that happens especially in youth sports and how you know, now what DeMar Hamlin's doing is trying to raise awareness for CPR training and for getting AEDs in high schools because you can, you know, save people who go into cardiac arrest. I read stories about lacrosse players who got hit in the chest and had cardiac arrest, basketball players, like baseball pitchers, baseball, baseball. pitchers. This happens. We, we weren't very informed or knowledgeable about it beforehand, but this isn't, if that is what happened, and again, like we, we don't obviously know his full medical diagnosis, but if you want to make that that jump, like that makes a lot more sense to me. And you don't have to go it's down any conspiracy. It's also numbers though, right? You're mm -hmm. online, we're all online, which means information is disseminated in a way that it never was 20, 30, 40 years ago. I have no way of knowing if more kids are dying in youth sports than they were. We just wouldn't hear about it. If something happened in Boise, it would never get to New York or to Miami. And now everything gets there within a second. Dan, can we talk about Pfizer? Are you suggesting that you found out that Pfizer's a sponsor and therefore Pfizer developed a vaccine that you're saying may not have been helpful, but it was good for the bottom line? 
I'm not making any accusations about anything Pfizer-related other than the way that I learned that Pfizer was one of the top 10 sponsors the NFL had was because of the number of people who are taking Hamlin's non-answers and assuming that he's protecting an NFL sponsor. Wow, that was a leap, man. <laughs> I didn't make it. <laughs> That's an evil, the question, evil leap. Man. Nothing personal. Yeah, I don't. I'm not taking that leap with you, Dan. It, it's they, there's no I'm not way that I'm taking the leap. I'm not taking the leap. Quit putting the leap on me. How does it me. feel, Dan, having this be done to you? <laughs> you leaped. You just brought it up. Is Pfizer a sponsor of the NFL? Top ten, according Dan. to Dan. Yeah, I'm trying to find like who the NFL sponsors are for this season, and I'm. You think that Hamlin got coached before his interview with Strahan? Hey, listen, here's the top 10 sponsors. Let's make sure we don't say anything bad about any of them. Do you guys like, and I I don't know what the answer, do you guys feel bad for him? Because like, I I feel bad for him in that like, he died a couple weeks ago. He had a miraculous, like his life was saved. He came back to life. And now he's kind of just being tossed in front of all these cameras and everything he's doing and saying is being scrutinized. And like, respectfully... He wasn't in this position before. Like, he wasn't a name that people know. So he wasn't necessarily prepared for this. And now he has to speak and be like this expert on these things Billy, that he yes. doesn't know. He doesn't he have to, said, Billy. Well, well, that's the thing. But he he doesn't have to. But presumably there's people around him that are encouraging this, I would think. He is now, trying, why do you think I, that? I think, so to go back to the same interview, he said, A, he liked being a private person. So being thrust into the public is something that he's not comfortable with. He said that in the same interview that now people are, are breaking down like this Bruder film. And he also said that he's he thinks like his purpose now is to raise awareness about this issue. So that is possibly one of his motivations for doing the interviews. I don't know if there's other motivations, financial motivations or things like that. But yes, Billy, to your point, I do feel really bad for him because, again, like if it were me, this is not a leap that I would have made before doing this sit down interview with Michael Strahan. Is that the oldest reference you've ever made on this show? This is a Bruder film? Yeah. Well, when did JFK come out? Because... It was oh, like, the movie? Wait, you know that from the oh, was movie? was that 94? I mean, I wasn't around in 63 when the actual Zabruder film was taken, David. No, but I'm asking, when you in your, in your sort of belly wick of references, do you view that as the oldest reference you've ever made? Guillermo, put it on the poll, please. Have you ever used the word belly wick at Lebitard show? Uh, what are you reviewing in terms of movies? And before we get to that, can you tell me what you made or what you thought of Steven St- Spielberg seeing Tom Cruise and thanking him for saving Hollywood, thanking him for saving the theatrical distribution, and thanking him for uh, saving theatrical industry in general? Well, Tom Cruise took a stand, and he's got the platform to do it. He's got the gravitas because he's got the bank to do it because he's that big a superstar. And he said, I will not allow Top Gun to be anything other than a theatrical movie. And if people are scared of going to the movies, uh, I'll get them to go because otherwise they're not gonna see Top Gun. And everyone wanted to see Top Gun. And he wants his movies to be shown on a big screen with real speakers and surround sound and everything else. And what Spielberg was saying was interesting to me because it's not like Cruz has a bunch of respect from people around Hollywood given his um, sort of strange proclivities in the Scientology department. But all of that said, what movie makers wanna see in Spielberg has an ego like the rest of them, they wanna see their work on the quote unquote big screen. And there was a danger post COVID that I think still exists today that movie theaters are going to be done forever. And what's more interesting, Dan, have you talked on this show about movie theaters changing how they charge tickets? where if you get a bad seat, you pay less than if you have a good seat. So there's gonna be like a secondary market for movie theater tickets? No. Oh, it's amazing. It's so strange that it never happened. How pissed off were you when you got, you were late to a movie, you didn't have a guaranteed location and you got there and you had to sit in the front row and you had to look up and it was too big in front of you and your neck hurt. And you're like, I can't believe I paid the same eight bucks as the guy who's sitting eighth row center. And it never occurred to people to charge different prices for different locations. And now with the technology where you reserve seating, of course it makes sense to charge more for better seats. And that's what theaters are doing. Jesus, and I, people David, are up in arms. That is such a terrible take. This isn't a, it's not a baseball game. We're not getting obstructed views here. It's a show. I mean, Have you ever been to a Broadway on. show? Yes, I've been, been to a Broadway, I've been to, so, I love Broadway, Broadway shows, shows David, please. 
No, that's my point. Do you not pay a different price if you're in the mezzanine versus if you're a throw center? Movie tickets have gone up so much in price in the last 20 years to the point where we were declaring three years ago that the movie theaters were dead and now the theaters want to charge people premium prices. How is this like, how does this make sense? It's just it's terrible for the consumer. Can we not just have one thing where we don't have to pay a shit ton of money to do something fun? Just you don't thing. have, first of all, it's so cheap to go to a movie. And second of all, you can sit in the mezzanine. It's what? not cheap to go to a movie. What? what? $15, $15 a person $15, to go to a maybe movie? maybe in 2010. Wait, what, what? This is an example where I apologize that I don't know the price of a quart of milk. How much is a movie ticket? When I lived in New York, I think just for a regular, like, showing, 20 bucks. I think it's like $12 here. Has it gone up? Yes, it's gone up. Really? It's gone it's way up. Is it really what kind $20 yeah, to go to a movie? It also depends on the theater. It yeah, depends on the type of movie. Are you going to like Bistro and stuff like that? No, like a regular this is a regular thing. IMAX. AMC. This is the AMC in New York 40X. that I used to go to. Even for a matinee, like on a weekday? Yes, no, matinees it's expensive. is where it's at, David. No, matinees got to be cheaper than that. Of course they are. Right, matinee, Whitty, buying I think. A ticket to Avatar right now. He'll Whitty, give us, the uh, give us a matinee. Thank you. 1829. 1829 for a 740 showing at the AMC Aventur of Avatar. Cool. How about a matinee? Give me some matinee numbers because right, the matinee is worth it uh, in order. When's the last time you guys all went to the movies? I, I, know, just, Roy, I know Roy went during football whatever, season. Whatever the last yeah. Mission Impossible movie was. Black <laughs> Panther, uh, Wakanda Forever. That was the last one, I think. How much was it, Roy? A lot. Thank you. But, but. It was well, a 40x nice. movie, though. It was a 40x movie, so it was a what? Uh, a what lot is 40x? Expensive. Yeah, what does that mean? It's more of an immersive experience, oh, like okay. uh, you know, the seats move, uh, oh, like waters, yeah. like surround sound, like it's it's a lot of money. Like, that the, is uh, not the, where my head was when you said 40x. The uh, the <laughs> where was your head? 40x, like there was single X, double it. X, triple X movies. Hmm. 40x to me would be like I assume it would involve horses or something. The matinee for Avatar was fourteen dollars. So for not, not including that's tax. a twenty percent discount. What are you reviewing for us this week? <laughs> Can we talk about? And I hope that everyone's heard of him, Bill Russell. Bill Russell died this year, and his number six is on the Celtics jerseys, and maybe on every jersey. I'm not sure. And there's a new documentary called Bill Russell Legend, and I had not realized. And I had known that he had the most rings and the famous picture with him in 11 rings, you know, one for the big toe. I had not realized what those Celtics teams were like, what those series were like against the Lakers and Elgin Baylor and Will Chamberlain. I had not fully realized how involved he was in civil rights with Martin Luther King. I had not realized how hard he had it in Boston. I always knew that Boston was racist for the most part because our players would talk about it. They couldn't stand playing in the outfield in Boston. Any of the black players we had did not like doing that. And I just never realized that uh, they were all white people cheering for him to win a championship, but then, you know, don't go to my grocery store. And I just was not as focused as I should have been on his story. And, I'm, and I love the NBA and I'm sort of respectful of its history. But even if you're not, you should watch this documentary. I don't know if any of you have yet, but what a life he led. And it is so difficult to have lived the way he lived and accomplished what he accomplished. And we never talk about him as the GOAT, it's LeBron, it's Jordan, but he is the winningest athlete of our time, of any time. That's how successful he was. And you can say they didn't play as many rounds as you have to now, that the basketball is different. If you put him on a team now, he'd stink, like Bob Cousy would be terrible now. But it is a fascinating three hours that go through his life and his job with the Celtics. And it really informed me about what a great organization they were. And the chance that Red Arback took when he named Bill Russell coach as a player coach and then won a title, it's pretty fascinating. It's called Bill Russell Legend. And I don't remember the platform, which pisses me off, but I think it's Netflix, but I don't know. Do you believe that 70 years from now, given what happens in sports with history and forgetfulness that Tom Brady will be forgotten the way that Bill Russell is being forgotten in these conversations that are had about, great, about greatest winners. You think that the time, how much time has to pass for that to be a thing? Zero in Africa. I told you my story of being in Africa for a month this summer. 
and I did polls. I did informal polls wherever I was. Not one person had heard of Tom Brady. Not one. That's 70 Afri years from now, he'll be nothing. That's Africa, though. That, that's not what, what I'm, I'm, I'm just what saying. I, I'm just saying you're removed several, uh, several times over. You're removed from American football. That's my point. You said how quickly know, will Tom but, Brady but, be But forgotten? I'm talking about in this country the way that we oh. regard Bill Russell. You're saying it's that whenever we have a GOAT conversation, Bill Russell doesn't make an appearance. So I say that's 70 years ago. It's because of time. He was beating my Will Chamberlain all the time. My grandchildren won't know who Tom Brady was if I have grandchildren. They won't know who he was? They will not. I've, no. asked, people, I've asked my kids. My kids don't know who Johnny Unitas was. Never heard of him. Roger Staubach, never heard of him. Never heard of him. Well, considering how this state of Florida is trying to make people forget about Roberto Clemente banning his book, I think it would be pretty easy to forget Bill Russell even further I, down the line. I mean, now you're opening a conversation that we, we should have because it's so, it's so unbelievable. And by the way, burning of books and banning of books has been going on for decades. But what DeSantis is doing in Florida is disgraceful enough that you shouldn't be doing business there. But all of that said, um, you'd be shocked at how quickly we're all gonna be forgotten. And it would depress you to the point that you would just stop working. Aren't you currently doing business in Florida? You're not in Florida, but you're presently right now advertising nothing personal on a show that's in Florida. Doesn't that mean that you two are making and doing business in Florida? I'm sorry, we lost connection. See you later, what, David. What <laughs> we'll talk to you next week.